Good morning. Church light today. To be ex to be expected. <laughs> to be expected. Well, to get started, let's turn in our hymnals to number 69. It's a responsive reading from Psalm 103. So when you're ready to participate, please stand. This is a responsive reading. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all our iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are ours. He made known his ways to Moses, the Lord who made known his ways to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. As for mortals, their days are the grass, and they flourish like flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and has given his rules also for all. Bless the Lord, O you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his foes, his ministers, and his people. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Now let's turn over to number page 70. Beginning at verse 23, reading through verse 29. The Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. I felt it was appropriate to just think about these words rather than use them as a routine repetition before taking the elements. Paul begins this little section of scripture and he says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. And I'm gonna share something with you right now that struck me but it's real. Paul wrote this book 
this letter to the Corinthians before any of the Gospels were written and di disseminated. Before. So he didn't read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to learn what it was all about. The Last Supper, the institution of this meal of communion, this celebration, this remembrance of what Jesus had done. Rather, he received it as a divine revelation. Remember, he went away for a period of time after his, after his salvation experience, and he spent time with the Lord, and the Lord taught him directly, one-on-one. -on -one. He called himself one who was unnaturally born. That's how he referred to himself. So the Lord provides and gives instruction to those who seek him and who ask for it. He provides in the instance what is needed to address a circumstance or situation. And the Lord knew ahead of time what the Corinthian church would become like. He knew the people involved and he loved them anyway. And he provided Paul this instruction, this understanding of this meal celebration. So that Paul could address it and say this is the way it's supposed to be. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. The night that he was betrayed, he instituted the Lord's Supper. He instituted communion, a celebration of his death, a remembrance of his death. Judas, who handled the money for the team, Judas would sell his soul for 30 pieces of silver to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the hypocrisy in this man's life who called him rabbi, he called Jesus teacher, he kissed him on the cheek as he turned him over. He thought he was doing a good thing. But his understanding was distorted by the evil one himself. And Jesus stood there and he took bread on the night that he was to be betrayed by one of his closest. On the night when Peter would deny he even knew his name. Three times. Jesus knew that he would be betrayed. He understood the hypocrisy that existed within Judas's heart. He understood the waywardness, the tossed to and fro mindset of Peter. That with his mouth and his pride, he would say, I will never deny you, Lord, not me. And then he went ahead and did it three times. And the ten others cowered in fear as they watched this happening. He was totally alone. The Lord Jesus was totally alone. There was no one supporting him there. No one. They were all gone. All by himself. And yet he proceeds to take the bread and break it and say, this is for you. The selflessness of this person, the son of man, the selflessness is the example which we should pursue in our own lives. As Christ is formed and shaped within our souls as we yield to him and his instruction in his word and he becomes real in us, that selflessness, that willingness to not allow the hurt to rule us. He was totally alone and he knew what was coming. Yet he went forth. He took the bread and when he had given thanks. He gave thanks. He's about to be betrayed. He's about to be denied. He's about to be left all alone by those around him in this world. 
and he gave thanks. He instituted this celebration with a prayer of thanksgiving. And I don't believe, his words are not recorded anywhere, but I don't believe that it was, bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts for which we are about to receive in thy bounty. In Jesus' name, amen. No, it wasn't your normal everyday grace. And I prayed that the Holy Spirit would allow me to know maybe what it was that Jesus prayed thanksgiving for. Did he pray with a thankful heart that he was the Lamb of God? That he was the substitute, like was provided for Isaac to Abraham on that mountain? Did he give thanks that he was going to suffer the wrath of God because he would take upon himself the sins of the whole world? Did he thank God for that opportunity? What did he give thanks for? Did he give thanks that he was about to reconcile all of creation to himself through what he was going to do? Did he give thanks for what he was going to suffer through in the garden that night? The sweating of blood, the crying out of his heart, not my will, but yours. Take it from me, please, God. Don't let me go through this. Did he give thanks for that? I think he gave thanks for the opportunity to redeem my soul, your soul, the soul of anyone who would accept it, even Judas, should his heart turn. I believe he gave thanks for all who were going to accept what he did on their behalf, all who he would inherit in his kingdom. I believe he gave thanks for what he could not see. It was the ultimate expression of faith. He trusted God not to allow him to see decay and rot in the grave. Most of all, I think he gave thanks that he would have another opportunity, one final opportunity to struggle through the giving of his will to his Father. And that is at the heart of what each Christian must wrestle with in their own personal experience and relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I think he looked forward to the opportunity to say it is finished. And he gave thanks that even though he had, he was crucified from the beginning, from the foundation of the world, it says in the scripture, he was crucified from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. He still came and he still did it. And I think he gave thanks for that opportunity. He took that cup, took that bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, there are many different ways of people taking communion in terms of manly human tradition, but here we have a very definite situation. We have a flesh and blood person taking a piece of bread and breaking it and saying, this is my body. His body held the symbol of his body up as, an, as a remembrance. This is my body for you. It will be broken for you. And this cup, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. He stood there, there was no blood. But the covenant would be sealed eternally in his blood. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 9. It's page 1189 in the Pew Bible. Thank you. 
beginning at verse 11. Hebrews 9.11, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and of calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. That is at the heart and the essence of the gospel. The high priests of the law in the Old Testament would go year to year, sacrifice to sacrifice. It was never fully complete, and it only made them outwardly clean. But the sacrifice of Jesus in his blood is eternal because he is the pure lamb of God, unblemished by sin, perfect and pure in every way. And the shedding of his blood was not ceremonial. Rather, it was given as an offering to cleanse us inside to cleanse our consciences from the guilt of sin, to know that we are free, not to sin more, not to walk carnally, but we are free and cleansed with a pure heart and a pure conscience so that we may serve the living God. And as we approach this communion, we must realize that this is not a ceremony that is external to us, but rather the person of Jesus Christ made this a personal statement, a personal act for the sinners in Corinth, the sinners in Douglas, the sinners in every household, the sinners in the world. And it is an eternal covenant that cannot be changed. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians, therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. I believe that what he is speaking to right there is that what we must not be careful of doing is making this a ritual, something done rotely, something done without being considered. There's a, there's a, there are churches I've heard about in northern Scotland that because of the, the sincerity of the words that Paul has in this scripture and the implication that by doing this the wrong way, we can bring judgment on ourselves. They only do this three times a year. Because they gear themselves up. They think about this and before they go to this table. And I think that this is what Paul is saying here. Whoever eats a drink eats the cup in an unworthy manner. We need to be careful that we don't look at this as some sort of a, a ritual, an exercise, uh, an act of obedience. Rather, it's a celebration of remembrance of what Jesus gave, of what Jesus did. That he thankfully went to the cross because he was thankful for this group of people right here, right now, considering what he did. What a beautiful thing. 
And I heard another story of a, of a church where the elders distribute communion. And there was one woman with tears streaming down her eyes. And she refused the bread and she refused the cup when it came to her. And, one of, and the pastor came from the table or the pulpit and he went down to her. And he touched her on the cheek. And he says, take it, woman. This is for sinners. Let us examine ourselves that this opportunity to celebrate this is that so we might serve the living God, that we might live for Him, that we might fear Him healthily, knowing that He loves us, that we might fear having judgment come upon us, but that we want to be right with Christ as He has made it possible for us to be right with Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to this table, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for the pain that you felt in allowing your wrath to be poured out on your chosen one. And Jesus, we thank you for what you did and what you gave. May our hearts be thankful that we now have an opportunity to be free from the guilt of sin, that our consciences can be clear because of your blood, your perfect sacrifice, so that we might live for you and serve you and learn to obey you in all things. In your name, Jesus, I ask these things. Amen. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. 10.30 next Sunday, folks.